California's water supply is being tested by volatile weather patterns, including droughts and extreme rainfall. To prepare for a future with less snow and more dry spells, the state must diversify its water sources, modernize its water infrastructure, and improve watershed collaboration. The stakes are high. Experts say that we could lose 10% of our water supply in the next 20 years due to climate change. Preparing for this challenge is a mammoth responsibility, confronting state and water leaders like those at California's Natural Resource Agency, where with the trailblazer in charge of this agency today, Wade Crowfoot. Welcome to What Matters Water TV and Podcast. I'm your host, Charlie Wilson. And as Secretary of Natural Resources, Crowfoot advises the governor on environmental and natural resource issues making him a key player in securing our state's future. He's a public policy and environmental expert with over 20 years of experience in water, fisheries, climate, and sustainability issues. Prior to joining the governor's cabinet, he headed up the Water Foundation, playing a key role in creating partnerships that included leaders in agriculture and environmental conservation groups. The results? Shared water solutions that benefit communities, the economy, and the environment across the American West. Let's learn more about the issues and opportunities facing California water and the man given the responsibility for meeting those challenges. Welcome, Secretary of Natural Resources, Wade Crowfoot. Thank you so much for being with us on What Matters Water TV and Podcast. And how are things in beautiful Sacramento? Well, never a dull moment is how I would term it. Uh, Lots happening, of course. Um, We've been dealing with you know, more and more weather whiplash between drought and flooding this winter. Um, so, you know, a lot of response, but also preparation for, you know, what's what's next. Well, we're going to dig into a little bit of some of the sort of the major issues you've got. But I, I remember and I can't ever get it out of my head when you first took this job, uh, when the governor tapped you on the shoulder and said, I, I need you to come from the Water Foundation. Did you really realize at the time just what a big responsibility and the the, the overarching uh, uh, goals and, and responsibility that is natural resources? Because it, it seems to me as I watch these wildly fluctuating extremes in California from the fires to the floods to water policy, I mean, did you actually realize how big and complicated natural resources could be? Well, I had some sense of the vast scope of the agency, uh, given that I'd worked for Governor Brown uh, for a number of years. But I think I didn't fully appreciate, you know, all that happens across the agency and all that we're responsible for. We're at this point over 25,000 employees, 26 different entities, uh, big ones like Department of Water Resources, which our listeners will know a lot about, and then smaller ones, including 10 state conservancies. Uh, And within those 26 departments, we're really charged with a whole lot of things, including help helping California adjust to this changing climate. So uh, I don't you know, I'm not sure I knew uh, just just quite the the vast scope of the responsibilities that that I and my colleagues would have. But that being said, uh, you know, every day we get up and, and do the work and I think we make progress. So you get up each morning. I know you do your your brief. What what crises of the day do we have? What emergency yeah. are we responding to? Okay. Oh, by the way, yeah, we're supposed to be forecasting and preparing for the future. Yeah, I think a lot about you know these jobs is trying to carve out the time to what I call play offense. You know, do the planning, get the proactive projects in place, versus all the response that you have to do. And given just the challenges we've experienced over the last few years. You know, there's been a lot of focus on emergency response, acute response to these challenges we're facing in real time. So it's always a balance around obviously, you know, responding to the the, the needs of the day, the week, the month, but then also looking forward to to build our preparation for what's next. Well, let's use that as a jumping off point, because as you hit on it, it's really about California and climate change. You know, there's an old adage a guy used to work for back in the 80s, you know, for better or for worse, it happens in California first. And I think you found we're really kind of the tip of the spear, both nationally and, frankly, internationally. But when you start talking about climate change, how do you see and what have you really learned is its significant impact on California's water resources specifically? And, and you know, how are you really preparing the state uh, and the different measures to mitigate climate change? 
Yeah, well, I think we start with a recognition that California historically has the most variable precipitation in the country. That means, you know, the most intense dry periods and wet periods. And that's been our, you know, collective experience, you know, over 172 years of statehood. At the same time, we know that this variability is getting more intense uh, across the world in Mediterranean climates, like the climate in California. I've spent time talking to colleagues in the European Mediterranean, in Chile, uh, South Africa, parts of Australia, and we all share uh, Mediterranean climates and we're all experiencing the same thing, which is the drier periods, the droughts are getting more uh, acute and longer and more punishing. The, 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 the wetness when it comes, comes in, in a more intense way. So, you know, building on this natural variation in precipitation, it's, it's intensified so much, you know. Charlie, we know that, you know, in October, we ended the driest three-year period in the state's history. And then in January, we experienced what is likely the wettest three weeks in our state's history, followed by a dry February and then a monster March uh, for, for rain and snow. So, you know, while we have always planned to build our resilience to droughts and floods, we know we have to do it in a much more urgent, intense way, given this accelerating weather whiplash. Well, I think, you know, and, and you highlight on it, and that's a lot of what we get involved with, right? What is the coalition? How do you bring people to the table? You know, good news, you know, California is really big and really diverse. Bad news, California is really big and really diverse. Uh, and I think all too often, particularly in the water world, we sort of focus on our water agencies collaborating. I mean, that's difficult enough. But really, you've expanded that. It's much more than just water agencies. How do you go about in a state as big and diverse as this of bringing everybody together to give you the kind of input that you need so that you can help, you know, both the agency as well as the legislature make informed decisions on what do we do next and, and in creating that sense of urgency? Well, I would definitely say it's a work in progress. And it starts with recognizing that we don't have a water system in California. We have a system of systems. As you know, you know, we have thousands of water agencies that provide water to Californians. Uh, and we have hundreds of very large agencies that provide water to most Californians. And so at the state level, we do feel like we're a leader in setting the direction uh, where we need to go across all of those systems. But it's really about working with the regional leaders and agencies, the, the local agencies, um, essentially putting wind in their sails, providing direction, funding, authorities, at times regulatory standards, uh, and then really supporting their leadership. You're right that the state is so big. You know, what's a challenge or an opportunity in, in the North Coast is vastly different than in the Imperial or Coachella Valleys, not to mention the coastal cities versus the Central Valley. So, you know, we say it a lot. There is no one size fits all solution to the challenges we face on water. At the same time, though, we do have, you know, there is a centralized leadership role that uh, that our governor, our legislature, our agencies need to play uh, in partnership with the federal government. And that is to set the direction uh, and to provide opportunities for locals and regional agencies to do what we know they need to do. Well, and I remember when we last met with you back down in Carlsbad, and you were at that point, you were just putting together the the, the climate resiliency portfolio, right? Yeah. And, and I also remember very clearly, you were, we were very direct with our board of directors. Like, I need you to participate and I need you to engage. If you don't, after it's published, I don't want to hear from you because I need you involved. I need you to be at the table. Um, and, and I always, we, we carry that really as a mantra for a lot of what we do now. Uh, and I think it spoke to what you just described. It's different situations. It's, it's got to be dependent upon your region, your hydrology, about your, your microclimates. You know, there is no plug and play for a state this size and this complex. But within that, I think, as you're also well aware, there's a lot of tensions that come up, particularly in times of stress where it's easy to point the finger at oh, those people or that guy or that interest. I know what I need and it's the somebody else's fault. How do you go about, you know, having done that resiliency portfolio, how do you go about sort of getting those tensions 
to, I'll say, either compromise, work together, you know, coordinate, collaborate. There's a lot of vocabulary that goes around that. But it seems, you know, it's a hard, hard thing to do that takes time and it takes a lot of effort. Yeah. You know, I would recognize that water in the American West is caricatured as, you know, an arena of conflict. And there's some truth to that. You know, because water is uh, less reliable, uh, often scarcer in the West, uh, there have been historically, you know, more conflicts, more tension. And that that obviously exists in California. You know, historically, there's been a lot of finger pointing, you know, whether it's uh, urban communities versus rural California, whether it's north versus south, whether it's uh, this frame of, you know, fish versus farms. And ultimately, you know, that conflict doesn't doesn't position us well for the future. So I would, you know, go, go back to Governor Brown during the last drought, 2012 to 2016, um, when we knew we needed to make major investments across our water systems. And that led to the Prop 1, the 2014 bond that voters approved. But Governor Brown also, uh, for the first time, established a, a water plan or water action plan for the state. The goal being, you know, the state government, state leaders can be transparent about what our priorities are for water in the state and recognizing what we need to do and bringing everybody together to help inform that. Governor Newsom built on Governor Brown's plan, and as you mentioned, you know, in his when his first state of the state uh, back in 2019, he called for our water agencies to come together and build this resilience portfolio. And portfolio is a word we chose carefully because it truly is a portfolio of solutions. And I think when you recognize that it's you have to do a lot of things uh, for a lot of different water needs, um, you know, our contention is that brings people together. In other words, we need to build water reliability for our cities, for our towns. Um, we need to help people that don't have good access to clean and safe drinking water to have that access. We need to restore the health of our, our rivers and our, our waterways. And our goal with the water resilience portfolio was to identify all that we needed to do and help everybody recognize that we're not choosing the Central Valley over Southern California or the environment over farms. We recognize that actually we need to modernize our system. We need to build uh, for the future so we can meet all of those water needs. And that's been that's been really the goal. Well, and I what I also love was after the resiliency package was completed, and it, it and it too, it's it's quite large, right? There's yeah. a lot of objectives within that. You followed that a, a couple of years later with a much more specific. Here's the investments. Here's how we you know setting some prioritization to that full portfolio. Yeah. And, and I think that's kind of sort of where we are today is like working through how we do that. But I guess one of the things that I still am frustrated with are the, and it's nice that they're all participating and they all have a voice, usually a very loud voice, you know, followed by some kind of a sharp rock. <laughs> but, but it's, you know, everybody seems to think, no, my way. And if it's not my way, you know, that way way is just wrong, right? And so yeah. things like, as you described, we have a very robust infrastructure that's currently in place that needs to be modernized. But there's a lot of constituencies right now. It's like, no, that's all, you know, historically very bad. We would never do that today. Abandon that. Let's move on. Right. Uh, we, we see a lot of that in the lessons learned in the power sector, right? We're going to move to this, not recognizing that transition, how long that transition takes. And I kind of refer to it now as more of a a really tightly woven tapestry that before you start pulling out strands, you need a very tight tapestry. And you, you know, as we're doing the transition, you do need to use what's cost effective. You do need to use systems that are in place. You can't just make it up out of whole cloth, out of something brand new. And I guess I wonder in the pace of that change, then are you frustrated with that? Do you have hope with that? Are we, are we actually getting the alignment that we need to actually come to some sort of compromise and the collaborative approach? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, we're not naive to the fact that there will always be, you know, opponents or conflict around broad decisions we're making that benefit the state. 
But that being said, I want to start with, you know, we had this water resilience portfolio. And as you pointed out, it was very comprehensive, 134 actions. And actually, we are holding ourselves accountable for following through on those actions. And there was just recently an update. But, you know, I think the critique was, well, if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. Right. And so even within that 134, we were clear there were there were high priority actions. But, you know, climate change accelerated. A couple of years ago, we learned that, you know, these hotter temperatures are significantly threatening our water supply. We can expect by 2040 about 10 percent less water supply year over year than we have enjoyed historically as a result of climate change. So we have to take that comprehensive portfolio and really drill down on what are the most important actions we need to take to protect our water security uh, for coming decades. And that was what we know as the water supply strategy for a hotter, drier future that the governor released uh, last summer. And what I like about that is it is really specifically focused on what we need to do with um, quantified targets. So for example, the amount of water recycling that we have to expand. Um, the amount of recharge that we need to capture, stormwater capture in urban areas, water storage above ground and below ground. And these are these are targets that we're going to hold ourselves accountable for. So I think that's really, really important. And in that, we take a very clear eyed view as to what we need to do. And this gets to the crux of your question, which is we need to modernize our infrastructure. We need to modernize our management to address what's here and what's getting worse. And that is that weather whiplash. We need to diversify our sources of water. So absolutely, we need to continue to deepen our efficiency and conservation, eliminate water waste. We need to capture that water when it comes, groundwater recharge, storm, urban stormwater capture. Um, we need to uh, identify more storage, including some targeted surface storage, but primarily underground storage. As I understand it, we have 850 million acre feet of capacity in our groundwater basins across the state to store water in winters like this. And we have to modernize our infrastructure, our backbone infrastructure. So while we are you know, diversifying our water resources, we have to recognize that that backbone infrastructure is still critical. Um, we'll still need to move water from the Sierra Nevada into the Bay Area and the Central Valley and Southern California. That just will be a reality. We can reduce our reliance on the importation of water from uh, those uh, tributaries in the Sierra Nevada through the Delta from the Colorado, but we're always going to need those. And so it, it's about modernizing our infrastructure, but it's really not a, you know, an or, it's an and. Diversifying our water supplies, becoming more locally and regionally self-reliant, and making sure that that backbone infrastructure is resilient to climate change. That is really the recipe for you know, continued success in California on water. Well, and that's one of the things I really loved about, you know, doing the comprehensive resiliency portfolio, getting the definition of what is resiliency so that we didn't balkanize a system, you didn't become single source oriented, where if that source or that particular technology wasn't available, you were just out of luck, right? You have to have, as you described, that backbone infrastructure. You've got to be able to move as conditions move and be able to adapt. And yeah, it's 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 not a it's not just a silver bullet one you know one shot we're done. No, not at all. I mean, anyone that tells you that you know that water solutions there's one primary water solution, I and mean, it's just not it's nowhere near accurate, right? And I should mention that you know within all of that work we need to do to stabilize our water system and ensure water security. Obviously, we need to continue to restore the health of our waterways and our rivers. You know. Our, our rivers are conduits for water supply, but they're also our environment. And they're also the protectors of our water quality. So, right. you know, it's not, again, not an or, uh, it's an and. We need to right. improve our water security. We need to continue to restore the health of our rivers. We need to ensure everybody has access to what you and I have access to, clean, healthy drinking water. And we can do that all together. Um, but sure, certainly there are a bunch of folks that sort of, 
throwing rocks if they're coming from one specific <laughs> perspective. Yeah, I want I want it my way or the highway. <laughs> so yeah. Let me, so of of those different challenges, what is it that really kind of keeps you up at night? Which is the stuff that you sort of find to be most vexing and sort of the hardest nuts to crack? Well, big infrastructure projects are very difficult to get done at this point in California, and I'd argue the country. And we have a really fragile water conveyance system through the Delta um, that is subject to earthquake risk. Our U.S. Geological Survey identifies that, that the similar risk that we have in the Bay Area, you know, threatens our that water infrastructure that provides water to three quarters of, of Californians. We also know that sea level rise is on the march, and that means more saltwater intrusion into the Delta. So I know that the Delta conveyance can be a controversial topic, and it's it's been a boy a topic on the water agenda for some time. But the the reason is is when you're in situ when you're in positions like the one I sit in, um, you have a responsibility to protect water supply for Californians, and if we lose um, fresh water control through the interior Delta. Um, you know, next month, next year, as a result of an earthquake, that is the that is water supply for tens of millions of Californians. And America hasn't faced a catastrophe like that. So I don't want to, you know, be perceived as being hyperbolic, and I don't think that I am, but our ability to actually upgrade and modernize that that core infrastructure uh, keeps me up at night because, you know, our, our processes to approve projects is really, really, really slow in California right now. And that's something that the governor and legislature are working to change. Well, I was going to say, you're right. I mean, I, I had experience with the power sector, right? And I, the, with the difference being you know, rotating outages in water is just not acceptable. Right? No. <laughs> just, it's, it's, it's not something you can do. So if you had a disruption, uh, and frankly, I'm a little surprised with this year's storms that we did not have uh, levy failures that we did not have flooding along the Sacramento Delta. I mean, you have some obviously in the Central Valley, but but it could have been much worse if we had had the kind of projected warm, rapid runoff uh, that was expected coming after the storms. Absolutely, but I'll and, and I'll say that you know a lot of people, a lot of institutions deserve credit for you know protecting communities during these this in, these incredible set of storms that we had this winter. You know, we know that there was levy failure, and that levy failure was fairly isolated and uh, and occurred at local levies. You know, our Army Corps of Engineers, Department of Water Resources. You know, these levies, particularly in Northern California, on the main line Sacramento uh, system, uh, held up under under tremendous pressure. And I think it's a testament to to you know investments and a lot of perseverance. You know, we we spent upwards of, you know, between the state and federal government, upwards of $3 billion over the last few years, actually since Governor Newsom took office. And most of that, almost all of that has been during the time of a drought. So, you know, we plan for flood during drought. We plan for drought during flood. It's like we have to maintain our investments and our focus on, on weather whiplash, regardless of which end we're dealing with at, at any one time. Well, we've done such a good job in 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 the generations past of developing sort of this expectation that water is going to be abundant and near free. And so the yeah. combination of, oh, wait a minute, it may not be abundant or not at least when I need it or want it. And oh, by the way, yes, I still do have to pay for some of these things. Um, and I think, as you pointed out, you know, major infrastructure, it takes 10, 15, 20 years to build anything of significance. And large, I think, as you say, large projects are very difficult. So how do we sort of accelerate, given that we sort of jump now from, you know, extreme drought to extreme, you know, precipitation and sort of back and forth? And you know, we don't know if we're headed into another six year dry spell or not. We just kind of don't know. Yeah. But in the meantime, we're literally operating on borrowed time. How, how do we sort of get these things accelerated, get the public participation, get the financing together and say, we got to go. It may not be perfect, but we got to go. Yeah. Well, I would say this. First of all, you know, collectively, we are going. In other words, there are hundreds of projects across the state, local water agencies, regional water agencies that are putting uh, that are getting, getting put in place to build resilience. 
So I think one thing we need to do at the state is continue to fund those projects. You know, our governor, our legislature have allocated upwards of $8 billion over the last few years through our annual budget process for uh, those those local projects. And just, um, you know, in the past year, hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe even billions of dollars have gone out the door to those local projects. We also need to help projects happen more quickly. Uh, we obviously need to review the potential environmental impacts of projects and either to avoid those impacts or minimize or mitigate those impacts. We need community input, but projects can't take 25 years to get done. And we can't allow um, litigation to uh, continue on for, for decades. You know, we have a system of a very careful system of approving projects that was constructed for a different era, a reality that doesn't exist. We have to move quickly to mitigate risk. It used to be that, you know, you think about new projects as creating risk. Now we need new projects to reduce or mitigate risk. And our failure to deliver projects increases our vulnerability to climate change. You know, Bill McKibben recently, who's a legendary environmentalist who founded 350.org, recently wrote in Mother Jones that, you know, we in the environmental community, and I count myself as somebody who came up in the environmental community, have to learn to say yes uh, more often. You know, so much of our environmental movement was built on saying no, on preventing bad things from happening and, you know, protecting land. And sometimes that's important. But if we're going to meet our climate goals on energy, if we're going to protect our communities, water security, we need to say yes to projects and we need to help these projects get done. So I'm really, really thankful. Governor Newsom brings a really intense focus on this, um, watching you know, the process move far too slowly. And I think the legislature gets it as well. So I'm anticipating in, in coming months and years, we're going to see you know, the, a thoughtful process remain to consider projects, but ultimately faster timelines to get these projects in place. All right. Well, and gentlemen, I started my career with maybe from a different perspective, sort of came at it, but he understood in the legislative process that there was actually an opportunity where there were some unintended consequences historically, and those things need to be fixed, mitigated, corrected. You know, the way you do that is through new projects. And so you start doing, as you have outlined, multi-benefit projects. They're not just done in isolation. We look at these things more holistically so that we don't have unintended consequences. And as you're putting new money into investment into that infrastructure, it gives you the opportunity to then make things better that would otherwise have been just sort of left behind without having the funding to do it. Yeah, there's so much opportunity for, you know, more of a multi-benefit approach to, to to projects. You know, there are so many nature-based solutions, uh, for example, that both recharge groundwater basins, reduce flood risk, and provide habitat. You know, and here I'm talking about floodplain expansion, not only in the Sacramento Valley, but also in the San Joaquin Valley or in, you know, urbanized Southern California, creating more permeable um, places within cities to take that runoff that would find its way into the storm drain, carry pollution into the ocean, get local governments in trouble, but instead actually capture that, let that percolate into the groundwater basin and provide supplies uh, for later. Right. And it's not that every project is gonna be perfectly multi-beneficial, but I do think there's kind of a, a, a change, a mindset change where there's a lot more focus on, uh, on the multiple benefit projects. Right. And then there's the issue, and there's that challenge about how we finance it. And I, I know a lot of, again, people like to be very simple about it. It's like, well, we'll just let them pay for it. Let, let's just go to Sacramento. Yeah, it's very nice. You put three, six, eight billion dollars into, you know, infrastructure. But, you know, we're talking tens of hundreds of billions of dollars of need. And yeah. nobody really focuses on what the, again, what that portfolio looks like of how you fund, how you put those things, and then how you prioritize. So where do you get the best short-term, mid-term, and long-term investment. Yeah. And, you know, we recognize, and we hear a lot from water agencies, there's real pressure on, on water rates and electricity rates. You know, we're working hard to maintain affordability in California, just writ large. And, 
you know, because California's economy has been so strong, because this is such an attractive place to live, obviously housing is very expensive. So we start with that as a challenge to affordability. But that then puts pressure on, you know, other costs of living in California. So how do we balance these necessary upgrades, modernizing our system, making it more resilient between, you know, ratepayers, local agencies, the state, and the federal government? And I'll say, though, that the federal government, thankfully, you know, under this administration and, the, and this Congress, have have invested more funding than in a very long time on water infrastructure. And that's finding its way into all regions of Southern California, including, for example, some of the really large recycling projects that Metropolitan and LADWP are taking on. So I do think the feds, the state need to continue to subsidize uh, the water infrastructure, but you know it can't be the state and federal government alone. It also has to be the local water agencies with prudent fiscal planning making those investments based on the revenues that they get from their rate payers. And we talk about that a lot here in Southern California, because one of those, you know, dichotomies is, you know, the water tends to be to the north, the people and the rate payers are in the south. And so when we start talking about rate impacts and, gee, what happens, you know, we need to be responsible and sensitive to our rate payers. Like, frankly, anything that happens in this state is going to be impact our rate payers because yeah. of, this is where the money comes from. So we really have to be uh, much larger in our perspective and not, again, look in a silo of, hey, I'm just Southern California. These are my needs and this is how I get stuff done. Because Yeah, I agree. And I'll say I, I'm really optimistic. You know, we're, we're talking a lot about the challenges and it's been a challenging few years on this weather whiplash, but I'm really optimistic. And I'll say, as we're talking about Southern California, you know, I think Southern California has the roadmap. I think the leaders and, it's, you know, you can't necessarily um, generalize about all water agencies in Southern California. But, you know, you've got water agencies led by Metropolitan that I think have a very clear eyed approach to what needs to get done, which is diversify those local and regional sources, shore up those um, the, the imported water and make sure that it's climate resilient and really find a way um, to balance water supplies in an uncertain climate. The challenge is these are big projects. They take a long time. They cost a lot of money. So it's really, to me, a, a challenge with implementation. But I think the vision is absolutely there. And frankly, it aligns with the governor's and our administration's vision of what needs to get done. Well, and the other thing that California, quite frankly, is really known for historically is being really innovative, right? We, you know, this is the you know where a lot of people come and a lot of new technology and a lot, a lot of innovation comes out of us. Are there any approaches or examples of innovation that you're particularly proud of or that you think uh, uh, we could continue to implement that has a real discernible effect? It's a great question, you know, and I, and I, I would agree. California is known throughout the world as the epicenter for innovation. And I would challenge our water community and say that I don't know that California has been the epicenter of water innovation historically. So I think we can continue to lean in um, on, on water technology. You know, one example I always bring up during the last drought uh, in 2012 to 16, I was a consumer uh, or a ratepayer at East Bay Mud uh, Municipal Utility District in Oakland, and they introduced that uh, very cool technology where they would compare your water usage to uh, your neighbors with comparable size yards and homes. And it was sort of like the keeping up with the Joneses app. And you would get a, believe it or not, a happy face, a medium face, or a sad face based on your efficiency. And they peer reviewed the effectiveness of that technology, which you could pull up on your phone in any given month. And what they identified is, as I recall, that it, it had an impact of three to 5% increased efficiency just by that peer to peer knowledge. I know that water agencies are also employing great technology around reducing, eliminating leaks. You know, in some cases, it's been, I've been educated to, to um, to assume that like 10% of water use in aging water infrastructure districts can be leaks or water waste. Yeah. A lot of technology there. We're doing some really fascinating stuff with NASA um, on the other end. So not so much consumer focus, but really understanding the evapotranspiration mm -hmm. or the usage of water across our state. Uh, and our ag community is using that to optimize water use. So I think that there's a lot of a lot of potential. I don't think state government is well positioned to choose winners or losers on the technology. 
or even, even innovate the technology. But I think we can continue to fund our, our local agencies and those pilot projects and the scaling up of what works. Um, and then I'd like to see more sharing across water agencies. You know, if I've long had this fantasy that we'd have a, a report card of the major urban water agencies uh, for their technology application, you know, or a ranking system to create some virtuous cycle of constructive competition. Like you hear about really great stuff happening in one water agency. And I, I remember experiencing this in a conversation we had led by Governor Newsom in the last couple of years. Great innovations in one agency that are not well known in other agencies across the state. So how can we facilitate more of that peer-to-peer -peer information sharing? I think that's there's great potential there. Oh, I would love that kind of potential. We we talk a lot about, you know, by their in, inherent nature, like, you know, water agencies or government agencies, right? They're pretty conservative with ratepayer monies. And so, you know, a new technology, everybody will sort of watch it. There'll be maybe a half a dozen <laughs> that'll experiment with it. And once they prove the concept, then everybody comes running. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, now we can go. So that yeah. uh, that competition and that sharing, I can see as having tremendous value. Yeah, I'd like to see that adoption happen, you know, uh, of the proven, yeah, because you need, you're right, you need somebody to pilot this at commercial scale. And there are agencies that are doing that. I'd like to see the adoption spread, you know, further and faster. All right. Well, I got to turn to something on you now personally, because again, I'm going to go back when you and I first talked and you took this job when the governor came to you and said, and you were telling me at the time, as I recall, like, I just got used to being able to ride my bike to the office. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, that's a much longer bike ride that you're going to have from home to the office by going to Sacramento. But are there people that have ideas or that have influenced you that sort of helped you get to where you are today? Because I don't think anybody sort of grows up as a, as a young person saying, hey, one day I'm going to be the Secretary of Natural Resources in California and take on all these huge responsibilities on climate change. But who, who is it that helped sort of craft your, your mindset, your philosophy, your career? Yeah, it's a great question, you know, and uh, sometimes it's hard to be reflective on one's own career because you're focused on what's in front of your nose, you know. Um, but I will say, I mean, I, I, you know, in many ways, I think I have the world's best job. I love my job uh, as as challenging as challenging as it can be. I mean, you know, having responsibility for protecting the environment, stewarding natural resources in California is just an incredible thing. Um, my dad was a professor of natural resources, actually, uh, at the University of Michigan, and I grew up you know, around these conversations on the environment, natural resources, spent my summers up in Northern Ontario, which is a place with more water than we'll ever have, coincidentally, um, and just and just loved, loved the environment. So I, that was sort of the beginning. Certainly since I, I moved to California, um, have had so many incredible mentors, started my career in government working in, in the city and county of San Francisco, um, with a lot of leaders uh, and people that were deeper in their careers in, in, in city agencies um, that really got me excited about, about the work. Um, and then I would say on water, boy, I, I, I'm not going to name drop because I know I'd leave somebody out, but um, I know- Oh, go ahead. It's, it's good TV. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, you know, just naming one, I, I, I know that you've uh, had a chance to talk on this program to Peter Glick, for example, you know, somebody like Peter Glick and the phrase I attribute to him is he, I think he's talked about if climate change is a shark, water are the teeth, right? Uh, and so, you know, folks like that, that, you know, are, um, have, have educated me um, on California water. I feel like in some ways, you know, California water takes a long time to get your arms around. And it's through people like Peter uh, and others that, you know, we're not always agreeing on, on, on these topics, but they've, they've dedicated their careers to educating. Um, so uh, that's been helpful. Um, I'll also say, and this sounds may sound a little gratuitous because he's my boss, but, uh, you know, Gavin Newsom is an incredible guy to work for. And, you know, I worked you know, uh, for him since days in San Francisco. And he thinks big and broad and aggressively on a range of topics. And on water, 
you know, he came into office and he didn't shy away from me. You know, in that first couple of months, he in the state of the state, uh, he called for a modification of the conveyance project. He called for us to put together this uh, water water resilience portfolio quickly, and he's continued to lean in. So, um, it's, he's been a he's been a fun leader to work for, uh, just because he's he's willing to do what we need to do. Very good. Well, I know you've sort of been in the midst of, you know, literally being thrown into the fire from the day you were appointed. And, and we talked about the, the enormity that is natural resources. Is there any story or a moment uh, in your tenure as natural resource secretary that you hold out to be most satisfying? Something you can say, hey, you know what? We got it right. And or we're, we are really on the right track here. Wow. Well, you know, I mean, I still feel like I'm writing the chapter of this, you know, of this job, um, but I definitely had my satisfying moments. Uh, people that know me, I hope know that like, I'm very cautious around um, declaring victory because I always, my mantra is I'm really proud of our progress with so much more work ahead. Um, but at the same time, I think in these jobs, you have to recognize you know, moments of progress. And, uh, you know, certainly one was uh, being in a dugout canoe uh, on the Klamath River with the chairman of the Yurok tribe. Um, shortly after we received word that um, the, you know, the federal government was on board with dam removal in the Klamath River Basin, you know, we're removing, uh, uh, thanks to tribal leadership, four defunct dams uh, up the up the Klamath River that are going to restore 400 miles of salmon habitat, and that incredible day being on the Klamath, um, just the the joy and the vision of those tribal leaders. We were out in the middle of the Klamath, and the chairman actually was uh, singing a creation story about um, the condor, which is now being reintroduced uh, in their in their tribal ancestral homelands. That's definitely a moment that stands out. Uh, I would say um, in the other part of the state, being down at the Salton Sea and actually uh, visiting and getting uh, a chance to take Governor Newsom to uh, our, our 4,000 acre project to uh, uh, cover up exposed lake bed that's creating dust emissions and providing 4,000 acres of habitat for the Pacific Flyway. That's a project that is almost done. And the satisfaction of being able to take the governor there to see the project um, that had been kind of in, in nowhere land um, when, when, uh, when, we, when we got in these roles. So, you know, really specific projects like that, I think um, are, are great um, uh, to, to experience. Then I'll say, you know, it's just sometimes when we do something and we can, you know, we we just know that we're making progress. Recharge is a great example. Over the last year, the governor really pushed hard on saying, you know, I want to remove barriers to getting recharge, uh, uh, groundwater recharge done this winter, right? Take a crisis, uh, identify the opportunity. And as I understand it, you know, we've been able to recharge across the state over 3 million acre feet of, uh, of water this year as a result of uh, a lot of things, including the governor's executive order. So those are points of progress. Uh, but again, proud of the progress with much work ahead. Well, as long as I've got you sort of in that sort of visionary sort of view, well, last question. Uh, what advice do you have for somebody who's just starting out in water or at least considering a career in water? I mean, because that's the other piece of this, right? There's a lot of turnover, a lot of people retiring, a lot of new yeah. leadership that is needed and coming into the system. So based upon what you have learned, some of the battles you've been through, what would you advise somebody who's looking at this as a career? I would advise them to take opportunities to meet a range of people in the sector and learn the different perspectives that uh, everybody has. I think that there's a new generation of leaders that are really tired of the traditional conflicts that have plagued California water, that are working across sectors and differences to actually identify solutions. You know, one organization I love is the Water Education Foundation. And every year they bring these diverse mid-career water leaders together and they spend a year 
essentially learning issues together um, and learning each other's perspectives on those issues. I think the water sector is fascinating. I think it's vital to our future. I think that it it's like one of the most important places to, to spend one's career. And I think we need to think differently. Yes, we need more innovation. You know, yes, we need to anticipate all the changes we need to make, but we need a different mindset. You know, we need a mindset that's not a zero sum game um, that, you know, my victory is the other person's loss. We need leaders that understand we need we need to provide water security. We need to restore the environment. We need to build equitable access to water. And increasingly, I'm seeing leaders like this emerge, and that gives me hope. Well, that is a great place to leave this conversation, not our last conversation with Secretary Wade Crowfoot. Wade, thank you for being with us on What Matters Water TV. I know we at Southern California Water Coalition very much appreciate your leadership. Uh, we appreciate being challenged and taking that challenge very seriously. And, and as you know, you know, we take our educational role very seriously. So it's big E education, small A advocacy, because you know, if we figure we get the education on the table, people understand the issue, they'll advocate in their own special interest. And that's actually what makes our democratic system work. So we very much appreciate you spending time with us today. We look forward to working with you and with the administration as we go forward on some of these major issues. Yeah, thanks for the uh, for the opportunity to dive deep, as it were, on these topics. Uh, always a pleasure, and thanks for all your work. I mean, it is a it is a really important role you're playing, educating everyone uh, to the the complex challenges we face, but also the opportunities that we have. Wade, thanks so much. Thank you. Well, thanks for joining us on What Matters Water TV and Podcast. If you like today's discussion, go to wherever you download your podcast and give us a five-star rating. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to our channel. That'll help us build our presence in this new world and on this format. If you're interested in helping sponsor this program, please reach out to us at SoCalWater.org and send us a message. As we close today's show, I leave you with this challenge. Be a part of the conversation. Be a part of the solution. At the Southern California Water Coalition, we educate to advocate. So as public policy leaders have difficult choices to make, together we help them make informed decisions. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you again next time on What Matters, Water TV and Podcast.